Hi, today we're going to be talking with uh, 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 Dave Richmond from Outdoor Obsession, uh, Whitetail Obsession Outdoors. White, <laughs> yep, Whitetail Obsession Outdoors. Yeah, uh, get get my tongue working today for this this uh, the call. Um, hi, my name is Roy Canterbury. I'm going to be your host today on Arch Talk uh, 101. And today, as I tried to mention, we're speaking with Dave Richmond. Uh, welcome to the show. Glad to be here. How's it going? Good. So what made you start uh, in your archery career? career? Well, I, re I really didn't have any mentors at that time when I was a kid, but I really started when I was about 13 and got my bow. My very first bow was a PSE um, Nova. I remember my dad would, my dad was not a hunter, but he would always take me. And every time I wanted to go, he would get up and go with me and that's kind of how i just i kind of just started on my own yeah that psc nova was a pretty good uh, bow to start with i was a PSC was. dealer about 20 years ago and and we sold lots of the novas you know they're, okay. they're yeah. a good entry level bow uh, you know mm -hmm. really really good one to start with don't spend a lot of money and and hey they work just fine it does yeah i, I had it for many years and then i i transitioned to i think bow tech after that and then just you know i shoot a prime now but they're all good bows really it's just whatever shoots good for you but yeah that PSE nova was great i shot many deer with that when i was when i was a kid yeah i used to sell a lot of those both right and left-handed and you know they had at that time they had uh, a couple different sizes and i i stocked all of them and you know nice things i also stocked them in left-handed so that uh you know the left-handers could come in and, and they could actually try the bow you know, that's okay, why yeah. here in, in Omaha area where I where I live and I had my store, um, I sold more left handed bows than all the rest of the shops put together because I stopped. Really? Them. Right. Yeah. Yeah. It, gotcha. You know, you got to cater to everybody that's in the market. Now, granted, it's not mm -hmm. as much. You know, I had one left hander and two right handers, you know, in each of the different sizes. But, you know, I had them and I would sell one and I'd, you know, order another one in. Uh, <laughs> one of my cool. shooters was left handed and got a new bow in for him and it shows up guys looking for that bow left-handed so sold the bow and ordered him another one <laughs> awesome you know, that, very cool that's what your shooters do you know when you come in and right. you're shooting and um you know bow comes in you you know nice about having a left-handed and right-handed shooters is you had the bow that they could always try you know if they were in the store right mm -hmm. and and you know being a higher end ones you don't stock as many of those because you, you know i i mostly cater to beginning archers okay you know starting out so that they you know get them started in the sport you know as you get more advanced then you know more about what you want to get but you know my idea was you know like on the stabilizer if you can't tell the difference buy the cheaper one right <laughs> yeah so after you went um started off with that uh now what, what about what year was that when you got your your first compound bow oh probably would have been 138 now so 93 yeah about 93 I started shooting archery 94 yeah. and got into it big time and just progressed from there I actually shot actually this buck over here um was my first buck that I actually shot um I shot it with a shotgun but that was my first buck ever um, when I was 14 years old and it actually got stolen. I have a crazy story about that, but it actually oh. got stolen from the taxidermist. Yeah. But I got, I ended up getting it back. That, that the interesting story, how that got stolen from the taxidermist. You want to yeah. elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. Um, it was, a, it's a 14 point buck and I actually shot it behind my parents' house and two weeks before um christmas they called and said that somebody broke into the tax service shop and and stole the antlers so at that time you know i was 14 i didn't really know what to do so my parents and stuff filled out you know filled a you know police report and nothing ever came of it we actually went on some outdoor you know radio shows just kind of getting the word out around the area that it was stolen and nothing ever happened and then actually 14 years later my current taxidermist told me to go on this website 
for lost and found taxiderm. I, I didn't even know it was a thing. And um, we went on there and I posted this little story and a picture of myself shooting it. And within like two days, it's funny, a 14 year old kid sends me a message and says that it was hanging on the wall inside of a gun shop. And I'm like, yeah, you know, whatever. So I said, when you go in there next time, tell your dad or something to take a picture of it for me. And sure enough, the next day he sent me a picture and it was, it was my buck hanging on the wall. So crazy, but we ended up calling the police and luckily the officer was a deer hunter. So he kind of understood, you know, the situation. So he met, actually met me there. He goes inside, comes out and says, yeah, let's, let's go get your deer. So we went in. He basically told the owner, we can do this the easy way or the hard way. And the owner said, here you go. Here's your deer. And the hide and everything on it was, it was really messed up. So I ended up taking it to my new taxidermist now and ended up buying a hide and he ended up remounting it. And then back then, you know, this was, you know, uh, 14 years ago, I guess, when I got it back. But back then there was no record you know, record book, actual book for Maryland. So, but I did, they did have a trophy deer contest. So I ended up enter, entering it in the trophy deer contest and it came in first place. Well, funny story recently, about a month ago, right before Christmas, Maryland, I found out that Maryland does have a trophy book now. And they actually contacted me and because they heard about this story and Luckily, I had it officially scored. The scorer is now retired, but I still had all the paperwork from it and everything. So I sent it to them. And now it's officially, I think, number four in the Maryland state record book. Oh, that's cool. So crazy turn of events, but it's safely on my wall. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. I know sometimes it's it's kind of weird how you do that. I, I know one of my staff shooters had his bow uh, stolen from his house. Really? Okay. Mm-hmm. And it was a, a PSC and it had what they call the good vibrations. It was a target bow. It had silver. It had, um, I think, blue, green, red, a whole bunch of different colors. And it just, mm-hmm. just, just a rainbow of colors. And it got stolen. And so he wouldn't shoot the stock strings. I always had to make, I made strings. I still okay. do, but um, I had to make him a string. So what I did is I took a red and green because it kind of matched. Mm-hmm. And see, I normally you twist them. Well, I braided the strings. So when you, I kind of counter twisted them so that it wasn't really braided, but it counter twisted them. So it formed little V's in the string. Okay. And, and red and green. Well, one of the guys was in one of the local shops and the bow was in for something or other. And one of the guys says, that looks like it's Randy's bow. Mm-hmm. So the owner, she calls me up and you say, you want to know some information about it. wanted the serial number. And I says, well, I'll tell you what, there's a spot on the grip that's worn because his hand kind of wore a spot in there. And it's a red and green string that forms V's as, as it's in there. Yeah, that's his bow, guaranteed. I mm-hmm. described it, didn't see it. So I got a hold of him, you know, want to know where, you know, the serial number, go to PC, and then we could get back there. And long story short, he, he got his bow back. You know, it's Crazy. just yeah. one of those things, you know, when you have something unique about your bow, you know, if it, there wasn't that many of them sold in the area, you know, because it's a target bow and, and you're not, mm-hmm. you know, most of us buy hunting bows and use it for target, you know, because, you know, like I, you know, I'm mostly, you know, going to hunt. So I shoot spots to develop my skill and I shoot 3Ds to help my yardage judging and, you know, shot placement all to hunt. You know, that's that's how I look at it. Yeah, people steal crazy stuff. I mean, there was like, there's, I guess there's a market for these big antlers, you know, people, they, they steal them. I mean, especially it was back then. I found out that there was people paying like three, four, five, six, seven, ten thousand $10,000 for a set of, a set of antlers. Yeah. And I'll say, you know, hang it up and say, Hey, this, I got this. And they're like, right. no, you didn't get it. You just bought it. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Pretty crazy. Yeah. Yeah. That definitely is crazy. So what what are you doing in uh, archery now? Mainly, uh, I'd mainly just deer hunt. Um, I do hunt public land and private land. And my main job, my business is 
consulting work in habitat. Um, I traveled to a lot of different states and designed a bunch of plans for clients and stuff and, you know, planting food plots and how they can hunt their properties, you know, better and increase, you know, deer activity and, and all that stuff. I do hunt uh, turkeys. Um, I archery hunt turkeys as well, but that's mainly what I'm doing. I'm just, um, I don't target, you know, our, you know, target shoot or nothing like that professionally or, or anything like that. I'm mainly just archery hunter. Yeah. It, you know, if somebody wanted to get a hold of you, you know, how would they get a hold of you? I have a website and I have like over almost 700 videos on YouTube, but it's all whitetail obsession outdoors.com and the same thing on youtube it's just whitetail obsession outdoors there's a lot of videos on there where i teach you know food plots and different types of techniques with habitat and, and all that good stuff so there's a lot of different ways you can get a hold of me but mainly youtube and my website yeah and i'll leave a link in the description you know for your your youtube channel and your website to make it easier yep. those pulling up the description just click on the link and yeah. And, and that way they can get there a little bit easier to get a hold of you. And it sounds like, you know, if you have some property, you want to get uh, a little better deer activity and hold them on there. Um, you know, you're the guy to talk to. Yeah, I can definitely help them out. I'm mainly on the East Coast, but I do travel to different parts of Kentucky and Ohio, um, Indiana. But it's mainly Maryland, Virginia, New Jersey, parts of Ohio. Uh, big time in Pennsylvania is kind of where my thing is kind of transitioned to is, is big time in Pennsylvania. Obviously there's a lot of hunters and fairly right. large states. So um, that's where a lot of my work is in Pennsylvania. I know there, there's some areas like the, the one area I hunt in, you know, it's, it's just a couple of fields and there's a little fence row that kind of surrounds it. And with the trail cameras up nice spot trail cameras, you can see when they're coming through. They either come through middle of night or right before shooting time. Yep. You know, they're, they're not there. And, and, you know, how do you get them to come through during the day? And, you know, and that's something that, you know, you would probably be able to give some advice. It's okay. What can I do to get them there during the day? You know, short yeah. of putting a feeder out and, and have it going off in the middle of the day so that they do come in them during the day. But Right. Yeah. It's a pretty common issue. You know, a lot of people have nighttime activity, especially with bigger bucks, but it's it's mainly because one, they either don't have cover close by to where they're they're actually bedding close. And then two, you just don't have the food. So if you create the food plots and you have the food, then most time a deer will actually find a place to bed, whether you have cover or not, they will find somewhere close by, whether it's on your property or not, but they will make their way to that food. I'm big on food and, and having the best as possible, whether it's actually, you know, a food pot that we make, or if it's just a natural browse type setup where you have a lot of, you know, forbs and grasses and, and woody browse for the winter time. But if you have that food, usually the deer will find a place, you know, to bed close by to get to your property before dark. Yeah. Cause I know around the property that I have there, there, there's a lot of forested areas, but they're, you know, next farm over and mm -hmm. you know not really there and it's kind of a travel point and you know not a lot of cover uh there's alfalfa field and then corn this year okay you know next mm -hmm. year it might be beans so you know once the corn's gone there's really no food there for them and so right. i can see why they come through so we just got to figure out you know how to how to you know get them to come there when time when it makes it worthwhile to go because yeah if they're coming through at night all the time um yeah. it's uh, may, uh, it's two two lots, so I'm probably saying maybe about 300 acres, maybe. Okay. You know, not not a big big section. Um, maybe even not quite that much, even. You know, not a big area, but you know, I got permission out there, and then the other area that we're hunting, it's private land, and and there is big field, and then there's a creek running through, and then mm -hmm. on the property that we can't hunt is where all the trees are at. <laughs> Gotcha. Yeah. And then this year, the farmer next 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 to us over there, he was constantly doing a bunch of construction during the day. So <laughs> yeah, it kind of throws them out. They're not going to come in while you're you're moving trees and dirt and building and they kind of yeah. avoid everything. Yeah, it's a lot to it. I mean, you know, with different travel areas and bedding close by and you know, different uh 
you know, if they're uh, pressured, if you have a lot of hunting pressure in the area, they'll just, you know, constantly push them out. But there's a lot of things you can do. It just really depends how the property is laid out. Some properties are just better than others, no matter what right. you do to it. You just can't, some, you just can't really help it. But there's always stuff you can do, but some properties are just better than others. Yeah. Yeah, that's uh that's always something you have to look at too, you know, and looking at for property is, you know, what's the mm -hmm. chance of holding them and, yep. you know, what can we do to keep them there? And then, you know, the farmer, they're out there, they're going to use much of their land for crops because that's how mm -hmm. they're making their money. And, exactly. and, you know, we're out there to eliminate some of the predators, uh, you know, on their food crops, mm -hmm. um, you know, because deer eat, you know, I forget how many pounds of food deer will eat in a year, but it's quite large. No, oh, yeah. Well, you figure six to eight pounds of food per day times 365. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a chunk of food. So, yeah, you know, a lot of food per deer. Yeah. And and I can see how, you know, a herd of deer can pretty much decimate a small cornfield. <laughs> mm -hmm. Easily. Yeah. Bears, too. Bears will, bears will wreck a, a cornfield. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, I see a lot of, yeah. Here in Nebraska, we don't have bears, so <laughs> don't have to worry about right. that here. Lucky you. I, I have yeah. a lot of guys that will try to plant, you know, these little small cornfields in, like, Pennsylvania or, you know, different areas. And usually when you have bears in that area, a small cornfield will be wrecked. A bear will just get in there and absolutely destroy it. Yeah, so you got a bear hunt. <laughs> right. Yeah, you got a, you got a bear hunt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of reminded me of a joke my, my uncle told me. He, he, I don't know if it's a joke, but this lady comes and says, "Do you hunt bear?" And he says, "Sure do, but I should get cold." <laughs> yeah, yep. <laughs> I've only been bear hunting one time, and that was in Nova Scotia. I oh, yeah. went up there probably about five years ago, bear hunting. I actually, shot one, but uh, it really, it really wasn't my thing. Honestly, I shot it with the bow. I just. I couldn't really get into it much, so I never went. I never went again. That, that's something I haven't done. You know, I thought mm -hmm. about doing it, but I haven't done it yet. Mm -hmm. I did go up moose hunting um, in Canada. Okay. Yeah, uh, that's my not dream. Not with with a gun, but uh, mm -hmm. uh, I did it with a rifle, and and that was an interesting hunt. You know, moose is. Yeah. You know, you get a chance to get moose. I think it's the best meat i haven't had elk really in steaks or caribou but you know you have you know whenever you have them in like some of these shows you know you have the elk yeah. and caribou or whatever whatever it's always made in like something else or dried or or something you don't really get the flavor like you do like in a steak but mm -hmm. man that moose was yeah it was the best meat that i that you i know, had it's, it's funny you say that because when i went up there to nova scotia that's all they fed us was moose meat and it was the best meat that I've ever had in my life. And I ended up t uh, getting some from them. I took it home with me, but you're right. It, it, it's the best meat. Yeah. It just, it's amazing, you know, how good it was. And, mm -hmm. um, you know, when, when you bring back a whole moose, I had a cow moose is what I had, okay. but it was mm -hmm. still, you know, the, the, the bones and the meat was still over 500 pounds. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, you know, I didn't debone it when I was up there, but I did cut it up. Mm -hmm. and, and I brought back the head and hide. And that was over 130 pounds just with the head and hide. You right. Know, so I bet. Yeah. They're, they're a big animal up there. And oh, yeah. 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 You know, I did see some up there. We almost, one of the guides I was with actually were driving down a road and he wasn't really paying attention at nighttime. And there was a huge one standing in the middle of the road. <laughs> Yeah, so, you don't want, yeah. don't want to hit them. <laughs> no, they would have destroyed us. Yeah. Yeah. Well, when you think about it, you know, where is their body? Their body's above the height of your car or truck, and they're mm -hmm. going to come right on top of it. So, exactly. you know, that's always something come you right have to, to yep. look at. Come and, right there, windshield. Know, what, what the um, guy from the launch does up there, he says, yeah, they never, you know, about every year they'll have a moose stand there and try and take on a train because the train oh, really? going through its territory. You know, the real territorial mm -hmm. and they'll stand there and try and take on the train. You know, okay. obviously you lose they lose that battle. It, yeah. Uh, um, you know, they so they says, you know, kind of be have to worry about that during the rutting season. You know, they'll mm -hmm. they'll turn on you. 
Oh yeah. That's, that's my dream hunt. I, I plan on doing it with my bow at some point. I'm not hundred percent sure where I want to go yet, but that's definitely my dream hunt. She won't want the bow. Yeah. There's, there's a lot of places up there. I went to Ontario. That's okay. where I went to the lodge. I went to up in Ear Falls. Mm -hmm. But that was, that was an interesting hunt. I'd, going out there and i'm seeing these people come there and finally got a snow and and we're, we're going to go down this road and, and we look at down this hill and i look at the guy's tires and i said you ain't going down there because you ain't getting down or getting back up because his tires right. are almost bald so we mm -hmm. turn around and come back and on the way back out i seen these couple of guys that they said there's there's a cow over there they didn't have a tag for a cow in that area and it's okay. different so i mm -hmm. look over there and it's down the hill and up the hill and and you know we kind of line up to shoot for them and and you know not knowing how how far it really was it looks like it was 250 300 yards but you know on a moose you've got a huge trash can lid size target to shoot at mm -hmm. so yep. it's a long ways away and and i just got a four power scope on my rifle and so i come up there and i shoot and it just kind of moves a little bit i said like, i must be shooting low now, mm -hmm. i'm a bow hunter i shoot 20 to 40 yards not 200 yep. you know exactly i i can shoot you know i was on a rifle team in high school so you know shooting's not any big deal so i said i must have been low so i raised up even higher so now i'm right about at the spine i shoot it kind of jumps still missed it's like mm -hmm. i must be shooting really low and so i raised up about head high i shot it fell over then jeez it didn't even take a step so we get up there i find little, one little bitty drop of blood and I get it field dressed, ain't found the hole yet. I get it back, finally get enough. I finally found the hole right at the base of the skull. Mm. I was shooting left. Yeah. And then I am thinking back is when I was sighting in at 100 yards, I was just slightly left mm -hmm. when I sighted in, not thinking about that longer range effect. Right. Uh, and what I, I was. I was right where I was at, where I was at it. I had the distance right. It was okay. It's just mm -hmm. a matter of my off right by, you know, you know yep. a half inch at a hundred yards. By the time I get the three is off by several feet. Mm. And yeah, you know, the same thing comes in, in archery. Yeah. You know, I've done the same thing. You know, when, when I was shooting it had, uh, um, you know, I shoot right-handed and I, I see, I see double. So my mind over the years of it just ignored the left eyes because the right eye was the clear ones. And for some reason, I started getting cataracts on my eyes. Now, okay. Start getting in your late 50s and 60s. That can happen, right? Mm -hmm. And so I drop on this deer. I know that pin was right where it's supposed to be. It was just as clear right where it's supposed to be. I shot, run off, and, and sure enough, nope, it wasn't a good shot. I got it because I hit the artery in the hip. Mm -hmm. I was like, why am I off that far? So I go down to the range and I normally, when I practice, I close my left eye. I draw back, nail in the target, open up both eyes. At 20 yards, I missed by, you know, I completely missed the target, you know, about two and a half, three feet off. And then mm -hmm. so I'm closing them on and off, on and off. And it's like, okay, figured out. All right, my left eye is picking up the pins. So now I'm kind of doing with those, you know, blink the eye and force you to look on it. And then I noticed when I'm going out, I had a hooded sweatshirt. As I turned my head, because I always wear a baseball cap, you know, like you're wearing, put the hood up, turn your head, it blocks the left eye. So, okay, problem solved. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, the same thing happens, you know, in archery and rifles. If you're off a little bit at close range, by the time you get out yeah. to longer range, you're off by a long ways. And yeah, I'm a... I'm a 20 to 20 to 30, 30 yard guy. I really don't like shoot past 30. I mean, I practice a little bit further, maybe out to 50, but I've, I will probably never take a shot at a deer past maybe like 40 yards. It's just, there's too much room for error. And I just don't right. practice enough to be confident for that type of shot. Well, my first deer I shot was 40 yards. I was about 20 feet up in a tree. And since mm -hmm. then I've shot a few at 20. Uh, I've shot most of them at 10. I've even shot at okay. about five feet. Right. You know, yeah. just just so close. And mm -hmm. and that's the other thing people don't realize is shooting up close. You still can't use your 20-yard pan. Right. Because now you're shooting, you know, too high. 
you got to mm-hmm. you, or you know, you're shooting off because you got to use you know like it's your five feet you got to use it like a 60 or 70 yard pin you, you know people don't understand is your eye and your sight is here but your arrows down lower because you know you got yeah. your eyesight the arrows normally line up fairly close to your mouth so that's the distance it's off to start with and it has to kind of join and, exactly and, you know, yeah. Whether you're shooting a bow or a rifle, you still have to compensate for all those different distances. You know? Yeah, well, most most hunters that are hunting elevated, the majority of time when they miss, they're just, they shoot high. Right. You know, with the and, deer, with the deer duck in and and all that stuff, but you always got to aim lo- a little bit lower than than you think. Well, and and then too, you know. If you know what a three, four, five triangle is, you know that's a right angle. So if you're over three, up four, the the long side is five. So, mm-hmm. you know, I was at on a tree stand on the top of a hill, or on a ladder stand. So you now I'm about fifteen feet up, and then the hill is way down below. So mm-hmm. I'm looking at this trail, and that trail looks like it's forty yards away all day mm-hmm. long. But yeah. I don't measure to the trail. I, you know, because just this last year I finally got a rangefinder, but. You know, I've hunted for many years with just judging yardage. So I'll take a tree that's on the trail, come up, look straight across. Oh, that's a 20 yard, that tree's 20 yards away. Mm-hmm. Here comes walking by. And I know it's a 20 yard shot. I put my 20 yard pin on it, even though the gear looks really small and, and got it because I knew that distance was there. And, and, you know, whether you're doing with, with bows or rifles at all, you have to worry about that angle. And have you ever have you ever used this was i mean this they came out with it when i was probably right around 14 but it was the uh the pendulum site where yep. the site actually would pivot yep i've had one yeah <laughs> okay that thing i had one that thing was awesome yeah that you know those, those are nice for those new archers that don't know what we're talking about um you you set it in at the level at 20 yards and mm-hmm. then you go from an elevated position and then you set it so that you're you're hitting on it your 20 yards you just you know it's a balance like a balance beam so then mm-hmm. you know at 20 yards you know you've got elevated and now then you know as you move up and down it compensates for that distance yeah uh, it doesn't compensate for if you're on the flat for 20 yards 30 yards 40 yards right you know, that you're going to have to do you know something different Mm-hmm. But it does help when you're shooting out of a tree stand. No, yeah. you know, you, it definitely you helps. Just, you just take where you expect and come out, set a target out there, climb up your tree stand and 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 set the pendulum so it works and it goes from there. Mm-hmm. I guess they I, don't, obviously they probably don't make them anymore. I haven't seen them. Yeah, pro- probably not. There's so many other things that's a little easier yeah. to do that. Yeah. But, um, you know, I started off, you know, the first sites I had was just a plate with s- slots in it. And then yeah. each pin, you you had one nut that you'd use for locking mm-hmm. it in place. The other one, you turn the pin in and out, so you could yep. adjust each pin at an angle. So if you actually can't at your bow, you'd be okay. But mm-hmm. you know, now they don't. But you know, that's just a little different well, sides little, and a little more advanced now. Yeah, the sights nowadays are so much nicer than you know what they had when I started because you know I started shooting before compounds existed. Okay. Uh, I started shooting in the 60s. The first gotcha. compound come out in, in the 70s. Mm-hmm. And, you know, one of the first compounds I shot was a bare whitetail too. Okay. Uh, and those, shot those for quite a bit. And then, you know, I finally got mine, you know, my bow. And then I now I progressed to different ones. And, you know, back in 2001, I become a PSE dealer. So, I pretty much awesome. use PSE now, and yeah. I still do. Even though I'm not a dealer anymore, I still, I still have my 2001 career that I hunt with, and then mm-hmm. a 2003, um, I think it is, uh, Scorpion mm-hmm. that I shoot with. I had, and yep. I had a few, well, eight years ago, maybe possibly, I did buy a PSE. It was a, uh, it was a PSE full throttle. Yeah. And that bow, I could not shoot. It was, it wasn't very forgiving. And it was, I could, I just couldn't shoot it. I ended up having to sell it, but I did have some other PSEs that were great. Um, it was just that bow. Obviously, it was full throttle because that it was the fastest <laughs> bow I've ever shot, but I just couldn't shoot it. It was it, very little room for error. 
Right. Some of the fast ones with you is the cam is so radical. As soon as it starts, mm -hmm. the cam takes over. So if you're yeah. at full draw and you collapse your form any, the boat wants to take off on you. And, and mm -hmm. you really got to lock into the form. Uh, some yeah. people like them, you know, some don't. I know one of the boats yeah. that PSC come out with that um, was either you loved it or hate it was the Baby G. I didn't, I never heard of that one. Yeah, that, that one was one that they come out and, and they stopped it. But then you could still get it, I think, through uh, one of the box stores or something. It was, mm -hmm. they gave it a different name, but it was the exact same bow. You know, they kept mm -hmm. making it because of that so you could get parts for them. But it was, it was one of those that, you know, either you like shooting it or you didn't, you know, right. there wasn't kind of no right. in between. And I, I know going through fitting different bows, there was one bow I really wanted to shoot. Um, after PSC bought Browning Archery, they had one that had counter rotating cams, mm -hmm. which was kind of a cool design. And I wanted to shoot that one. And it's like, you know, being a dealer, I'm going to, I'm going to shoot. It. I just could not get it to fit me. No matter what I yep. did, I couldn't get it to fit me. And I was like, okay, I give up. You know, I'm not going to, yeah. you know, try and force it and, and, you know, shoot something that I don't like. And, you know, then go from there, you know, just get, find a bow. And, and and that's what I recommend is beginners. Go try the bows. Right. You know, and I imagine you'd probably recommend the same thing. You know, what would you oh, say yeah. to somebody wanting to start out in archery? Absolutely shoot them because, I mean, they're all, I think we said it earlier, but they're all good bows, really. You know, this with the technology they have in them, it's just really whatever one is comfortable that you're comfortable with shooting. And anywhere you go, they'll, you know, obviously you can shoot them. And I'm actually currently looking, going to be looking for a new bow this year. I should currently shoot a prime, but I'm going to be my dealer not too far from here. I'm going to be shooting PSEs. I'm going to be shooting um, elites and Matthew, whatever they have until I find one that really feels comfortable for me. Yeah, I know when I, you know, before I bought the shop, I would bought uh, Matthew's Q2. So okay. I, I had a couple other bows and then I, I shot that and it was really good. I got it all set up. And in fact, when I first set it up, I, you know, shot through paper, which really doesn't tell you much, but it shot a perfect hole through it. And mm -hmm. so then when I, I bought my, the store, uh, the archery store, um, it was other things as well. It was originally fishing and tackle and then I just, you know, archery and kind of whole sporting goods place. And I'm going down to the dealer school. One of the things you got with a bow with, with the dealer school. And so I go down, I says, I tell him, it's like, okay, I shoot, currently shoot a Matthews Q2. Which one of these should I get? Mm -hmm. And they told me, and sure enough, yeah, I liked it better than Matthews. So I went ahead and sold the Matthews. But, yep. you know, how can you be a PC dealer and shoot Matthews? Because I couldn't sell Matthews because there was a dealer within 50 miles of me. So I couldn't okay. sell it. Right. But, yep. You know, they that is nice about the Matthews is they do have a territory you can't have two Matthews dealers within certain range of each other. Um, that makes sense. You know, the other ones don't. And one of the things that PSE did is there's there's your main line and then your pro line. And they're a little bit different bows, a little bit better features on some of them. And if you're not a pro shop, you can't sell uh, the pro line. Okay. No, that's one way that they do it. And, you know, there's all kinds of different ones. You know, I've had people come in and say, well, I'm going to go get the best. I'm going to go get a Matthews. It's not the best. You got to shoot what you like the best. Exactly. And exactly. What's they make? What's they some, make good bows? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. What's some of the new one? The newer PSEs they have out now. Uh, I haven't looked at some of the new ones. They they come out with so much stuff, and I'm not in the market to buy one, so I try not to mm -hmm. um, look at them. You know, like I, I tell them, it's like if you're not ready to buy, don't shoot it. <laughs> right. Yep. And I, I, cause like, I'm still using the thing. I'm not ready to buy another bow. I still have, you know, my two PSEs and actually have a bear as well. And when okay. I was working at Cabela's, they get the return stuff and there's always something wrong, you know, a string or something. And they come back in and as able to buy it, you know, thousand dollar, a bear, um, a bow uh, for, I forget it was 200, 300, 100. I forget what I paid for it now, but I was able to get, you know, pennies on a dollar for it but i mm -hmm. had to, it needed a new string and when you're looking at buying a new string if you had to buy them you know you're looking at well back when i was making them 100 bucks for a string set of strings now they're i don't know what they are i, I haven't priced them recently because i want a string i just make a new one <laughs> right now yeah. do you sell the strings i i do some i don't make them 
and and send them out. How I do them is I have the bow, and then I'll I'll match the string to the bow because there's mm-hmm. things we can tweak. If I know exactly, you know, like, um, you know, some servings don't go all the way around the cam, so there's part of it exposed, so I can make it longer. Right. Or some yep. might be four inches past the cam. You mm-hmm. don't need that long. You know, be a little right. faster string, and then so you can tweak it however you want, custom colors, um, and I just kind of fit them fit them to the bow, and you know. I don't want to get it, you know, I don't really get into, okay, here's a string for uh, this prime bow. And then I know all the distances and stuff like that. You know, I, I don't really want to do that. There's, there's other guys that do that really well and make good strings. Mm -hmm. Right. When I had, when I had my store, um, pretty much, uh, if you need a new string, I just made them for you. Okay. You know, I, I could take, um, in fact, I did this one, that one guy calls me up about ready to close and say, hey, do you have a string or can you make me a string for, for my bow? And I said, oh, I don't have any. I'm closing it a little bit. And he says, well, I have a tournament tomorrow. My, mm-hmm. I need a new string now. And I said, well, come yep. on in. So, um, you know, some of your your cams, you can't put as many strands on. You know, there's mm-hmm. always a range on your strands. Like that might be 12 to 14 strands or 12 to 16 strands, whatever the material is. And you can vary them. Well, on his, it needed a little skinnier track. So mm-hmm. I started making one. I got the end done, tried it, not too wide. So I threw that away because you're not going to undo them and take them out. It's just quicker to just make a new one. String material is too cheap to waste your time. So I made mm-hmm. another one and I got his string all going. And it was less than an hour when he walked out. Okay. I was getting but ready to he, ask you how long it typically takes. Yeah, it it don't take a long time to, you know, to make a regular string. Uh you know, if you're making cables as well, depends on if you have, you know, uh, two cable, two Y cables, or a Y cable, a control cable, and a string. Uh, it just depends on what you do. You know, whether you, you know, what what you have to make. But mm-hmm. you know, you're looking at, you know, probably an hour and a half. If I'm not trying to do a video, uh, I'll be mm-hmm. making the strings, uh, right. and that takes a bit longer because you feels like, oh, okay, I got to redo this and do this, and yep. um, you know, it don't take long. And you know, the more of them I do, the the quicker I get, you know, mm-hmm. I don't do one for a while and I'm a little rusty and it takes a bit longer to do them. And, you know, making them, I'll try different things. I took, like I said, on that one bow, I, I twisted them opposite directions. So then it formed little V's in it. And I took mm-hmm. on one of mine. I actually braided, I had three strands and I braided okay. them like you'd be braiding. Right. So it was a braided strand instead mm-hmm. of being just a normal, you know, twist one, just something different to try it. And uh, that was on my bow for many years until it finally just broke sitting in the bow case. <laughs> oh, wow. Yeah, the, the the one thing I've had people come in is, is, is it normal to have the string break over the, the summertime? Open up the case, there's a broadhead sitting in the bow case. Well, yeah, I wouldn't have a broadhead in your bow case. <laughs> yeah, right. You know. I, 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 years ago, I had a i don't remember what bow it was i can't remember and it was practically brand new and when i actually pulled it back the entire bow blew apart as you're drawing it back yeah i it was never dry fired that i like when i it was brand new and for whatever reason i don't know why but it just it literally blew apart the strings flew off of it the the uh the limbs like the one snapped I was like, what in the world? I can't remember what bow that was, though. Um, reflex? Something reflex. Yeah, that, that could be. Yeah, but yeah, it just blew apart just by pulling it back. Yeah, I know. Uh, I've heard of people having you know problems with that when they, they take it to a shop and they have the work done or something. And what's not noticed is they haven't put the string back on the cam so as you draw back Mm -hmm. it actually slips off or cuts it Mm -hmm. Uh, i've seen that that's why you know i have a whole process when i get ready to do it i'll pull up on the string in there and i'll follow the strands every every part of the string through the whole thing and i'm pulling up on it and then start cranking it back down you know to make Mm -hmm. sure i have have all the the strings right in the cams where they're supposed to be right you know check the pins make sure they're all good and and you know that's that's one of the things that you know I just got in the habit of doing, and just to make sure. Because yeah. last thing you want to do is start cranking, and all of a sudden it comes off, and then it cuts your brand new string you just put on, and now right, you exactly. make a new one. And yep. I'm assuming you know, that's yeah. what happened. 
Yeah, it, it could have been off, and, and people don't really know to check that. And mm -hmm. that's something well, I that, check now. You know, they, yeah, they always check now. And um, talking about bows blowing up, I had had one that I was getting ready for hunting season. I'm trying to get it all all set up, and I'm shooting. And then next thing I know, it's it's off. So I'm readjusting, and I'm shooting again, and it's off. And I keep mm -hmm. doing this, and finally, it's like, okay, what's going on? So I go up closer to the to the backstop. Okay, I got to figure out what's doing up close. I draw back, and as I shoot, I'm holding half of the bow in my hand. The other half come back and smack me in the chest. The riser broke, so it oh, was wow. one of those old poured magnesium risers, which aren't you know strong as they are now. And, yep. and it, what it was doing, it was fatiguing, and it was just weakening and bending and bending and bending until it finally broke. And I didn't, mm -hmm. I couldn't see it. I didn't know it. And you know, now something weird starts happening like that. It's like, okay, back up what's going on <laughs> yeah i actually had um it was probably about 10 years ago i was actually climbing i climbed my stand and i always you know have a pull rope to pull my bow up and it was early in the morning still dark out and i pulled my bow and it must have got caught with a twig and it actually took the string off the cable oh yeah so <laughs> yep so i was like man you know what am i going to do so ended up Come, climbing back down i i left i drive an hour to my archery shop they put the string back on i go back to the farm i get in the tree and i shoot that buck <laughs> so that was that was a pretty crazy pretty crazy day i was like i thought i was like done for ah oh, the bow shops it's middle hunting season they're gonna be busy they're not gonna be able to help me out but he he did it right there went right back and had success pretty crazy yeah, it's always a crazy story yeah, there's always a crazy one. I know um, one time was was going into the tree stand where I wanted to be, and I was like, okay, we got in a little bit late. So I'm climbing up in the tree stand. I'm in the tree stand, strapped in. My bow is still not really set up yet. It's still just hanging on. So as he pulled it up and set it up, and here comes this nice buck. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, now I got to get the bow in my hand, get an arrow yep. knot, get ready to go. And I finally get there, and then he steps out, and I shoot. Get it? It wasn't until later when I sit in the back of the truck when I went back to the store. I realized how big it was. Laying in mm -hmm. the back of the store, sitting down, you know, a little bit lower than where the the bed was. I could right. see the rack. Oh wow! It's like, oh, this because I never noticed. I didn't have time to even look at the rack. I just focused on where I wanted to go and and mm -hmm. shot it. Yeah, I had a similar story. Um, I was hunting the rut and I was off for like an entire week, and I was hunting, wasn't seeing much activity. And it was the last day that I was able to hunt. It was like 70 some degrees out. It was hot. I was sweating. I said, all right, I'll just, I'm going to go. So I ended up getting in my stand in the afternoon. And as I climbed up my tree. As I'm pulling the bow up, I hear something. I look up and here comes this buck chasing this doe. So I hurry up. I pull my bow up real fast. And I had my re release on my hand. I pulled it up real quick. And I still had the, the string attached to the cable. Oh. And I didn't care at that point. And this buck was chasing this doe around me within, you know, in circles. And I just, I drew back and was able to shoot it right there. But after not seeing any bucks the entire week, 70 some degrees outside. And it just so happens that, uh, you know, I still had the string attached to the bow. Didn't even have time to take <laughs> it off. And I shot one. You never know yeah. what's going to happen when you go. No, in the woods. You, you don't. You know, we, you know, we all have stories like that where we're, mm -hmm. you know, we go in and things like that happen. And yep. um, I know one time I was, I was in the tree stand and I hear this deer coming from the right and to the right of me and, and coming down towards me. And then, so I turn in my stand, get ready. And, and as I am draw a uh, full draw, waiting for the deer to come out, I hear one coming from the other direction, down the opposite direction that the, this deer is coming from. Mm -hmm. and so that one steps out i shoot that one see which way that one runs off so i know which direction it went turn around knock an arrow draw back and shoot the other one mm -hmm. <laughs> the only problem with that is now i got two deer to track and yep. two deer to prop you know field dress and two to haul mm -hmm. out <laughs> yes that's the worst part is hauling it out yeah it, it, it can be and it's nice now is you got you know those uh carts that you can have i have yeah. one that 
it's like a backpack size that you can just mm -hmm. throw on your back and go. And some of the oh, other okay. ones are just so huge that it's yeah. just, you know, it's a major task. We just go out and bring it back in. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I've seen some where the, uh, the, the hang on stand is actually a ladder, uh, a cart. So it has yes. wheels on it. So you can pull it yep. in and, and then use it as a cart and take them back out. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's all kinds of stuff like that. Yeah. I you actually know, just him. bought a new cart this year and I regret it because it, I was like, Oh, I'm just going to buy the biggest one they have. I bought the biggest one and it's just, it, it's more of a nuisance than anything. I'd rather just drag it. Yeah. Well, we have a couple guys dragging them out. You know, you, you grab them, you know, each one grabs an antler or if it's a doe, then, mm -hmm. you know, you just stick a rope around it and pull the rope and it, it, it's yep. quicker than throwing it on a cart. The only thing you run into no, is big logs, you know, going right. over some exactly. of the logs, it's a little bit more work. Yep. And you do tear up the hide a little bit as you're pulling it out. But yeah, yeah. Most For of us are sure. not going to do much with the hide. You know, we may tan it or something, but a lot of times you tan our hair off anyway. So it doesn't matter. Right. Yep, exactly. Well, what what would you say to a new archer that's looking in, to get into it? What would you suggest they do? I would suggest, like we talked about, you know, getting that bow and just shooting shooting one until you can find one that you're comfortable with shooting, and then just every day a little bit shoot a couple arrows. For me personally, like the more the more that I shoot, the worse that I feel I get. For some, it's I'm weird like that. The less I shoot, the better I am. So, like, usually, you know, during good weather or something, I'll shoot maybe three, four, five, six, seven arrows or something at a time instead of shooting a couple dozen. You tie yourself out, and then you end up developing, like, bad form or something. So, right. for me, I have I have rough shoulders, so I'll only shoot a few times, and that keeps me good enough to where I have a good form without tiring out. So that would be the best tip is try not to overdo yourself to where you're holding it and you're actually start, you know, shaking. If you get to that point, then you have to lower your poundage a little bit until you can develop that strength to shoot more weight, but have a bow that's properly set up to go to a good archery shop. Because a lot of times I see people are either, either shooting too short of a draw length or they're shooting too long of a draw length and you just develop bad habits over time. And it, sometimes they're hard to break. Yeah, they are. And 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 that's why, you know, a good coach is is definitely um, you know, an advantage for you to not have to worry about, you know, it's mm -hmm. like let them tell you what to do. And and you know, we're out hunting, you know, which right. which is the most important arrow? Mm -hmm. The first one you shoot. Because exactly. you don't normally get a second one. So yep. uh, you know, you can go out and shoot and shoot and shoot and you get bad habits, and then you're better off to shoot you know, two ends of perfect shots right? than shooting a hundred ends of improper shots. Yeah. And, and shoot and shoot elevated too. hang a tree stand. Right? If you got a backyard, you get a tree in there, have a little target out there and just and shoot from an elevated position because right. it's a heck of a lot different than shooting on flat ground. Well, and one of the things that a lot of people will do is they'll have their arm out and then to shoot down, they just drop their arm. Yes. Bend at the hip. And, and, and you can't, you got to bend at the hip and bend over. Uh, mm -hmm. you know, that's your form is this way. Cause if you start dropping the arm, the peak moves away, draw length changes, yes. and mm -hmm. then your whole force is differently. Cause now, now you're, you're, you're just in a, a weird position. It's not normal. And yep. same yep. thing goes exactly. back or forward, just twist at the hips, you know, what you're doing, mm -hmm. you know, the hard part is when you're shooting uphill you know, or downhill and, mm -hmm. and it's too far to bend at the waist. And I guess start bending knees and, um, you know, those are challenging shots, but you know, those kind of, kind of fun to do. Yeah, they are. And like you said, people will just move their arms and try to shoot and not at the hips. And that's that's a great a great point. Right. And and I've been an archery coach since 95. So I've taught you know, okay. hundreds of people how to shoot. And, mm -hmm. and you know, I put together a, a online coaching program where we, we get together. I got some videos for you to watch. And then, you know, you can upload videos and we'll critique them and then get on the live call. And then we can look at okay, what are we doing here? We can make corrections in there because mm -hmm. I can see what you're doing. Um, you know, and the recorded ones, you know, it's better when I started because there it was pretty much, you had a VCR that you recorded yet shooting. You know, that was mm -hmm. pretty much about it. 
you know, you didn't have cell phones that could take pictures. You right. Know, and the big, big movie cameras. Yeah. You weren't going to spend that kind of money to video them. So when I first started teaching, you had to just watch them shoot and try and pick up on all the fine things. Mm-hmm. Now, you know, with the way things are, I can just play it back. I can stop it. It's like, oh, okay, that's what you're doing wrong. And then, and then you fix them. And, um, you know, so I have, I have a free 50 minute consultation call that I offer to those interested in, you know, looking at coaching, see if it's for them. And I have a little form to fill out and I'll leave a link in the description for that as well. You know, for people that they want to think about coaching, you know, get on call with me. We'll spend 15 minutes and see, you know, Hey, is it something I can help you with? It might, might not won't know until we get on the call, you know, so that's one thing that I offer to any archers as well as in the Archer Talk 101 uh, Facebook group, you know, I allow them to uh, upload videos, you know, raw videos of them shooting and, Mm -hmm. and, you know, some every can, you know, critique, you know, critique it. Uh, We have archers in that group uh, all over the world. Mm -hmm. And uh, from some countries I've never heard of, I have to uh, Google, Google the uh, location. You know, go up right. on, on on maps and say, okay, where is this country? I've never heard of it. You know, and you know, all over the country, as well as we have archers in there that have been shooting for you know, seventy plus years, as well as those been shooting for maybe uh, seventy days. Now, is this <laughs> the, the, the archery range. talk? Is this a website too, or is this just the Facebook? Uh, yeah, I have the Facebook group, Archer Talk One Hundred and One Facebook group. I also okay. have archtalk101.com. Okay. And then archtalk101 podcast, you know, all the right. same theme, uh, you know, just all focused around, you know, archery and helping new archers out. And, you know, I enjoy helping them out, you know, a new archer and even, you know, experienced archers. I've had some that have, you know, shooting at the, you know, the top of the games and, you know, mm-hmm. into your semi pros and, you know, yeah. it's like, hey, take a look at what am I doing? What am I doing wrong? And it's like, well, let's see. Okay. I'm getting really, really picky. <laughs> you know, here's one thing you might want to change. Mm-hmm. And, well, we can and, all learn something. Oh yeah. You know, even, even the top archers. And I was just watching the um, uh, bear boat from Lancaster mm-hmm. archery. the shooting last night instead of going to sleep, <laughs> but uh, I was watching it. It's, it's amazing. The different forms that they're using and, you know, the, the techniques from, you know, just kind of flinging your fingers open to, right. you know, I, I never watch anybody, um, you know, kind of pull around their face. Um, mm-hmm. There's there's a couple archers that, that I watch, Jake Kaminsky, and mm-hmm. I watch his YouTube channels. He's got some really good advice on on shooting uh, a bare bow and Olympic style archery. Um, I mostly teach compound. You know, mm-hmm. I, I, I do teach, you know, traditional um, fingers, but you know, my, my main focus is on compounds and yeah. Lancaster, um, Lancaster archery is only hour for me. I, I've been there. I go there all the time. Uh, trying to blank where they're at. They're up in. It's PA. Virginia? Yeah. PA. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I forgot. I know it's one of those two States up there. I couldn't remember. Yeah. So that's yeah, nice and close up there. Yeah. yeah. I actually bought my, uh, bought my PSC full throttle from there. Yeah, it, they're, they're really good in in that. I know around here we have Saunders Archery. Okay. Um, actually, Saunders Archery is in in Nebraska, mm-hmm. not too far away from me. And if you remember those great big round four foot mats that you sell, Saunders yes. used. To, I don't I don't know if they still are not, but those great big round mats, mm-hmm. they're made from grass grown in Nebraska. Oh, really? Yeah. And then cool. I know just just a few miles from me here, uh, they got a plant where they make uh, the points. Okay. And and I got some of my friends of mine that Tom Tom Saunders is is their coach. Yeah, and he's he's been around for a while. Very nice. You know, when when you have Tom Saunders as a coach, you know, there's not a whole lot I can help you with. <laughs> right. Exactly. Well, and that's one of the things I do. If, you know, you know, if you have a coach and you're having problems, I can still coach you. But mm-hmm. I'm going to coach a little differently than if you're new and I'm teaching you from new. Because one of the things to do when, when you're coaching somebody that has a coach is I'm going to ask a lot of questions. What is your coach telling you to do here? What is he telling you to do here? And I'll look and see, are you doing what you told me he told you to do? You know, that's how you coach somebody that already has another coach. Because 
Mm -hmm. one of the things you run into is if you have you know like if you're trying to teach somebody i'm trying to teach somebody i might teach them slightly different you do and then they get confused all right i I know my son went through that in shooting trap His, his first time out shooting trap he did probably as good as he did after he was shooting for a year with coaches hmm. because this person would teach one way, this person did one, then you get another person teach. So everybody was teaching to do something different. He just got so confused that, you know, you, you can't do it. You know, that's why, I, you know, I, I recommend going with, you know, somebody, if you like what they're teaching, the way they're teaching, go with it. You know, I, right. Exactly. When I was putting together my coaching program, I had, uh, um, a guy I was messaged on messenger, you know, I was talking about archery and so I don't know how we got initially connected. And he said, he don't, he don't have any coach anywhere close by that can help him. And so I said, hey, I'll, I'll, I'm thinking about putting together an online coaching program here. I'll mm-hmm. coach you for free just to see how it's going to work. Mm-hmm. And so I, I'm coaching him. He'd send videos. I critique and go back and then going back and forth. And, and, you know, he was improving and um, then You'd never guess where he lived. Lived in Italy. Oh, really? Yeah. So my first online coaching student was in Italy. <laughs> yeah, completely different area. Yeah, and then he he joined my my group and he invited a lot of his friends there. And then the mm-hmm. second guy to kind of help out on the, uh, the the Zoom call to teach him as another guy in Canada that I was helping out with, and he started out with you know maybe six eight inch groups and and then uh a few weeks later he sent me a picture of three arrows touching no it's so, awesome <laughs> you, you know that that's the kind of stuff that you know a coach can help you out with and right uh, i i know when i had my shop i had a guy come in buy a brand new bow his first bow he bought a, an upper end bow um he was a, a phd and a phd so he you know had the money he could spend whatever he wanted and two weeks after he bought a bow, brand new archer, never shot archer before. Two weeks later, comes in with a Robin Hood. Really? <laughs> you, you awesome. know, so I, I know what I teach works. I've seen it many times. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, getting a Robin Hood is nice. Just be prepared to buy arrows. new arrows. Yeah. Right. And, and I've I've done that many times. Uh, in fact, oh, yeah. I did it when I was working at Cabela's. I did it twice. Uh, mm-hmm. One was a customer's bow, put a drop way on it. Only way you can test the drop way is going to shoot it. So this is not even bow. It's not even set up for me to set it for him. I draw back, shoot an arrow, try again, shoot again, stuck two arrows together. Guy was sitting mm-hmm. there watching. I was like, and there's somebody do that. Like, yeah, well, guy come in and say, yeah, I was having trouble with it, grouping. <laughs> Ain't the bow, dude. <laughs> yeah, it's not the you bow. Know, yeah, I just stuck two arrows together with your bow. <laughs> so mm-hmm. it's it's got to be you. and. And the other time I did it was uh, um, Cabela's got in some, I think their bow tech was making a special bow for him. We got it. Um, we set it up. I set up for me. I shot two two arrows, stuck two of them together. Another guy shot it. And so I was shooting just fine. Then they come and say, well, we're having a lot of trouble with it. Nobody can get them to, to, to set up right. Like uh, we just had four different people shoot this bow with four different draw lengths. And it worked mm-hmm. just fine. You know, so we're thinking, yeah. is it the bow or is it the text? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. And that that's the thing, you know, on, on where to go. Like you said, go to the go to the pro shop. If you go to places, you know, your box stores, you, you know, not to pick on Cabela's or Bass Pro, but Shields and Dicks and all those other ones like there. You don't know what you're getting for a tech. Right. Exactly. Because they could be anybody. Right. The uh there's an archery shop by me. I don't, I don't go to that one. It's a little bit too far, but th- when you walk in the door, it says, this is not a, this is not a pro shop or this is not an archery shop. It's a pro shop. Leave your feelings at home. Right. <laughs> yeah. I like that. <laughs> you know, it's uh it's a little bit far from me, but it's a very popular uh, bow shop and the guy, the owner is a little, he'll, he'll tell you how it is. You know, if you're doing something wrong, he will correct you 100% and People sometimes, I guess, don't like that. So it's hard for him to get business, but it's a he's very, very knowledgeable on uh, teaching and setting up bows and all that. Yeah, and that's what you need. And, you know, fortunately, mm-hmm. when I was working at Bass Pro, there was four of us there that had many years, you know, working on bows. I think between the four of us, we had, you know, 80 or 90 years worth of experience between the four of us because we all had been in it for a long time. And, mm-hmm. and then when I went to Gabella's, I, 
I'm, I'm teaching everybody else how to do it. And then the guy right. I worked with at Bassworth come over there and, you know, so between the two of us, we've done all kinds of things. And, you know, I used to say, you know, we, we've set up bows any way you want. If you want to set your bow up to shoot two arrows, we've done it. I've mm -hmm. done it one night. You know, that was back when they had the stick on rests on there. You know, the newer bows, it's a little bit yes. harder to do that. Uh, yep. There's a compound bow and a guy says, can you set my bow up to shoot two arrows at the same time? Hmm. And I says, why? <laughs> you know, all the other shops said, no, can't do it. I said, well, come over after we close. So won't get interrupted. Let's play. And, you know, we, we went through all kinds of different things of setting up because using a release, you know, how mm -hmm. to set the loop up, um, you know, how to, how to space them, how to, you know, your knock alignment, all that. And, you know, what we determined was, you know, you, you had to have the string on top of the top arrow and on the bottom of the bottom arrow. So as it pulled mm -hmm. back, it pulled them evenly. And we okay. was able to get a spacing that varied no more than like about a um, eighth or sixteenth of an inch spacing mm -hmm. between arrows, you mm -hmm. know, by, by tweaking it. And, you know, we probably spent an hour and a half after we closed. We closed at eight. So we're spending an hour and a half setting this up. But you know, learn about a lot about, you know, how to transfer, you know, your force. And, you know, you'll see people put the loops underneath the knock or all kinds of different things. And the most efficient way is to have your knock above and below your, your, your knock and, mm -hmm. and go from there. Now, with some of the really, with some of the really, really short axle bows, you know, you might have to put, you know, tie a knot above and below it to, to force, you know, a little bit of gap so you don't have, you know, quite so much pins on the back of the knock. Mm -hmm. uh, but you learn so much on there. And then, you know, between, you know, adding in uh, what I learned in teaching archery and shooting archery and, and all that, as well as, you know, my many years of martial arts training, I kind of merged them together uh, to, you know, so I understand and, and can transfer information, you know, most efficient way to transfer energy is straight through the, straight through it. Mm -hmm. So you want the back, of, you want your force going straight from the knock to the tip. If it goes any other way, you're losing force and you're sending it off at a, at a wrong angle. And, right. you know, one way I'll, I'll show them sometimes is, okay, take a pencil and push straight on the on the eraser. Now turn your finger slightly and push and what's that arrow do? Mm -hmm. you no, know, that's that's the point, you know, go with. So you want to be, you know, plumb and level and all that on there. And, you know, the new bows are all center shot design bows. All the compounds are. And... Believe it or not, that's a PSC patent. Okay. Oh, really? Yeah, they patented it amongst other things. Okay. But when they come up with their first one, that they patent that design, hmm. but never enforced the patents. They allowed everybody else to shoot them. You know, so when Matthews come out with a center shot design riser, that was uh, PSC's patent on their their riser hmm. design. But PSC, didn't know that. they they didn't they didn't go out and say, okay, this is our design, you can't use it. They designed it, they patented it, and then they allowed other archery companies to, you know, manufacturers to use that same design. And okay. each company owned lots and lots of different uh, uh, patents. Interesting. Didn't know that. That You learn something new every day from somebody. <laughs> you do. Always do. That's yeah. what it's about. Yeah. Well, it's been great talking with you today. And yes. we'll have to do this again. I'm sure we're, we're we'll cross paths sooner or later, and meet yes, in person. Yep. And uh, yeah, so I'd like to thank you for being on the show. It's really been a lot of fun. Yeah, no problem. Thanks for having me on. You have any parting thoughts you want to let our listeners uh, know about before you head out? Well, if you're looking into getting into bow hunting and and archery and stuff, it it's a great time to do it. It's fun surround yourself with good people and, and practice shooting, practice from elevated shooting and ground shooting and get out there and hunt. It's, it's fun. It's fun stuff. Yeah. And shooting from different positions, like off your knees and stuff like that mm -hmm. too. Just everything you're going to do. Yeah, exactly. You know, put yourself, put yourself in uncomfortable positions and it's just going to make you better later on. Yeah. Well, once again, my name is Roy Canterbury. I've been the host on Archer Talk 101 with our guest, uh, Dave Raymond, or Richmond. Richmond. <laughs> I can't I can't read. <laughs> Sorry. And uh, um, we'll, we'll 
see everybody uh, the next next podcast. Uh, right now it comes out once a week, but I'm thinking about going to twice a week. Uh, so just just watch for the next one. Just get on and and uh, uh, follow it and subscribe, and we'll uh, we'll see everybody next one. Sounds good. See you guys. All right. All right. Bye.